doing work that's brand new, really, for him and many people who know Stackhouse, uh, and there are many, many people globally who do, uh, think of him doing work kind of like that, that big print, which is really one of his very best prints. That's a language that he created, an artistic language that he created, that he's largely left behind. Uh, rather than talk anymore, I'm going to ask Carol and Bob, in whatever order, in unison, if they'd like, to say a few words about themselves and their art. Thanks for being here, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you uh, before I, before I go, let me let me say to you that I've got we've got uh, Bob's work, as I suggested earlier, is very well known and highly regarded. His work is archived at the University of South Florida, and this monograph was published well a few years ago. It's available here for thirty dollars. If you'd like a copy, I've got a dozen or so. Uh, it's very helpful in understanding where Bob's been and uh, has a. a I don't know if it's not a catalog resume, is it? Yes, yeah. it is. It is a catalog resume of his prints. And and Carol's too, because she she was she's in sort of the, the tail end of it. Okay, that, all right. That in any of event, it's a very very wonderful uh, uh, background for uh, Mickett Stackhouse. Well, um, I guess I guess we can address the collaboration thing and how we met and how this work came about in some ways. Um, Carol Mickett had a um, radio program called Arts Radio in Kansas City, Missouri, and um, I was doing business in, in Kansas City with, with a major collector out there and um, was invited by Carol to be on her radio program for an hour. And we had an hour conversation, which Carol did, unknown to me, a lot of research on me. And uh, so she was very informed during the uh, um, during during that hour. And then she was later hired by this collector uh, to do a film about me. And uh, it, it became an award-winning film. Um, and I like to make a joke, it's a film about my life that she did in 12 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> But it, it, what it did is it, it so succinctly characterized sort of the way I worked. And, and, and she knew what it was that I was doing and how I was going about it and stuff. And, and through the conversations that we had, things really, really started working out well. And uh, we eventually got married. And we probably were collaborating well before we really knew we were collaborating and well before we announced that we were collaborating. Uh, probably one of the earliest announced collaborations is the uh, American. the American print, which is around the corner um, in, in near the window. It's a, it's a framed print around the, the back. And it, it, it's called the American print because we made it in Cortona, Italy. Um, it's just the way sometimes we think. Uh, we were doing another print, and this one designated as this is the print about something we did in the U.S. rather than the other print, which was about more about Cortona. So, so our our way of working uh, sort of evolved over over a period of time, and we we came through this through through different ways of doing things. And uh, why don't you pick up? Um, so when we came together, I had I had been a university professor in the philosophy department. I have a PhD in philosophy, and I had left the academy and was doing radio and theater and writing. And so when we started to work together on the film, we found out that our um, aesthetics were very similar and that we worked very similarly. And I think that's why we're able to collaborate. We're both process people. So um, when we start something, we aren't fixed on what the outcome's going to be. We allow the process to take us where we want to go. And I think that since we're both like that, that allows us to work together. If we weren't both like that, I think there would be a lot of conflict. 
and I have to say, there still is a lot of conflict. Um, and a lot of our work is about this collaboration. Because when you have two very strong people, um, <laughs> we're both right, and we're both like it our way. Um, but we also both know that working together takes us to places we would not go on our own, and that we make choices and end up doing things that are very risky, but have always turned out to really pay off. So as I said, a lot of the work is about our collaboration and the new series about the moon. Um, and if you haven't been to the show at the Ringling College, at the Selby Gallery, that show is a big sculptural installation and two large paintings. And it's very much about the moon. It's the big sculpture is called um, Breath of Cyprus Moon. And the reason the moon has come about is, again, about collaboration. Because the moon is something that we see because of the light of the sun. And the moon's always been something that's been identified with women. And that, I have to say, always bugged me that the only way you got seen was because the sun shined on you. But then I realized <laughs> that, you know, the really the way we see the sunlight is through the moon. And it's really about collaboration. And we all of us trade off on being a moon and a sun. And in collaboration, it's very much like that, that we reflect each other. And the way we are in the world is a result of how we each reflect each other in the communities we live in. And so, so the moon's become this very important icon for us about collaboration and just about being in the world. Well, I think, I, you know, I, I, I can speak, you know, Carol was talking a little bit about, about the subject of that and, the, and uh, sort of a, a sense of concept. And, and something about our collaboration, too, is that I get very excited with how do you do that? You know, how do you, how do you realize something like that? How do you realize the moon? If you notice, the moon isn't very detailed. And we, we purposely chose not to detail the moon. What we're trying to do is to see the moon as the naked eye uh, sees it, possibly during the day. In other words, uh, we became fascinated with a daytime full moon in a cloudless sky. And the moon looks translucent, it looks transparent, it looks ghost-like, like a veil. And, and it, what we're seeing really is the light bouncing off the moon. So one of the things we attempted to do as artists with the moon series is to try to paint the light coming from it. And the, uh, we, we sort of got into it with these white-on-white -white paintings um, of, uh, you, you can see how we, we kind of saturate color in a way. We, you know, when we decide we're going to do blue, we do blue, right? <laughs> you know, nothing else involved in it, you know? And, uh, and, and so we, we got into these white ones. That, that particular piece right there is, is of a sculpture that was in New York City that was built in our studio, taken apart, and moved up there. And, you know, th that's another aspect of our collaboration is that, that we, both strive for ways in which these structures that we build fit into a situation, fit into the to the environment it's going to, and then we we match that with with really sometimes I have to say this quite ingenious engineering. I mean, you won't find it in a book anywhere, but it's a way of of making these things so they come down and go back together and can be built in one place and moved to another place much like a stage set, in a way. And uh, uh, so we, we have that kind of sensibility with each other. And so the, the challenges sometimes that Carol as a philosopher can come up with are, are, are things like, this whole series is about the identity of, of ourselves uh, and the identity of water, where we live, how you perceive it. Uh, all these squiggles behind these images that you're looking at on the blue paintings uh, people have wondered what those, what all that spaghetti is, and if you look real closely, you can tell it's the Gulf of Mexico. 
Why have to do this fine as well? I was going to ask them to talk about this, but you see, you probably may not have noticed it before. And then go ahead, Bob. Sorry. Well, that's that's just you know. So as as artists, what we're doing is we're taking the icon of a fairly common thing like a, a, a tarp in here, and we're we're integrating it with with these lines of the Gulf of Mexico. We're doing it both. Uh, uh, sort of conceptually, and we're doing it very physically, so that there's a relationship between the lines uh, mm -hmm. that are are meaningful and identifiable, as is the the tarpon, but something that we all are very much aware of, uh, which is the Gulf of Mexico, since we live on it, uh, but we don't see it that way. We, you know, that's an abstraction of the Gulf of Mexico, but it's very real. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's probably taken from a photographic uh, satellite image of the Gulf of Mexico, you know, and it's the topographical changes of, uh, of stuff. So we've, we, we uh, have become involved in mapping things because they're, they're very, uh, um, you know, they're very, what, what, factual, and yet they can be very abstract at the same time. And that becomes a device uh, that, that allows us to bounce one image off of another and to get some kind of a dialogue happening from it, which is exactly what happens with us. We bounce things off one another and we get this dialogue happening. So there, there are these kinds of levels of involvement. Does anybody have questions? Yes. Without this discussion, I would never have seen any collaboration. This hmm. is the total light spectrum. All of the others are a very narrow spectrum of the light and saturated. Mm -hmm. This is very ethereal. Mm -hmm. These are very earthly. Mm -hmm. I don't see the collaboration. I'm glad you do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't, I don't mean to detract from The collaboration the, of... Between the two? Yeah. I mean, they're just totally... Like between said, the work or the between us? No. Oh, the between... Spectrum of light. Mm -hmm. One narrow spectrum. Mm -hmm. Saturated. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, the total spectrum. These are very earthly drawings. Right. This is very ethereal. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you see a, a, a collaboration. Well, the collaboration, the, the, or the collaboration really reflects the fact that they both, the ideas are co-germinated, so to speak, but there's two different, really, bodies of work here. Well, it's just a comment. I just, well, no, I, I yeah, think it's, it's an interesting, interesting one. I mean, yeah. you're, you're, nobody's ever raised that before. Well, the thing <laughs> is. Incidentally, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. Are you? Right? Yes, I am. Ah, where do you live? Well, I lived on the plaza. I now so did here. I. So did you? Okay. Yeah. Blue Gallery. Ah, I, I lived in the Park Lane before it was made into sure. the hotel. Okay, I lived at uh, Kirkwood Circle. Ah. If you've right. never been to Kansas City, go there. It's a great city. It is. <laughs> well, the thing about the movement from the blue paintings to the whole moon thing is that and that's why you need to see the show at the Ringling, because that explains the moon thing, was it was a move from talking about water and the and how we were doing that, and then the relationship of the moon to water and the tidal connections. You see, that's why this show's that's called nice Tidal job. Work. And nice so <laughs> it was that move that um, I think I think another thing about collaboration too. I mean, when we first started looking into collaboration, I remember we went to the Museum of Modern Art in New York to their bookstore and started looking for all the mm. books on collaboration. And so we got this wonderful big book and we opened it up and looked at it. And here was a poem. Here was a picture. Here was a story. Here was a picture. Here was here was some words. Here was a picture. Here was a picture. Here was a picture. So the collaboration that we saw in that book on collaboration, which is a very great book, was Here's this side, and here's this side. And these two people are sort of making a sandwich of art, and but they're very, they're very individualized contributions from this artist and from that artist, and it makes a whole. What happens with ours is we mesh it. We don't work like that so, at all. So we both work on the drawings, we both work on the color, we both work on the concept, we both work on. So, so what happens is, it, is we're really, I, I guess technically we'd say we're a team. It, it, it's more like the way a film is made, you know, in, in a way. And it, it, you, you, uh, you, you have different, you know, we're, we're all working towards a common goal. Uh, there's, 
the blue is no more representative of Carol because she's wearing blue than, than the white is of me because I'm wearing black. <laughs> you know, so. so we work on everything together. We paint together, we build together, we conceptualize together. Sometimes she'll start on one end and I'll start on the other end. We kind of meet yeah. in the middle. So like this painting right here, would both yeah. of you actually participate in the... Yes. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> so it's not really one artist. It's no. Two. No, it's yeah. two artists. All the work in here is two artists, you except that what I'm saying. I mean, this is the yeah. total spectrum of life. Yeah. 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 Right. And we're and glad you think that. And this is just a very right. narrow spectrum mm -hmm. of life. Mm -hmm. The blue and saturated. Mm -hmm. How did you resist the temptation to leave blue out of the daylight moon scene? Mm. It must have been a leap of faith to say even the palace of blue is not the uh, Well, we didn't evident. want it to be literal. I mean, even though they're recognizable, we really work on not making things super literal. So to make the sky blue would be as though we're just trying to copy. So what we're really trying to do with it is an icon. Mm -hmm. and, and the same thing with the tarpon. That's not a real tarpon. It's not even trying to be a tarpon so much. It's an icon. Yeah. You know, so it, people look at it, and they, if they know they're fishes, they know that's a tarpon. Mm -hmm. You know, but people do know that's a fish. But, <laughs> so, and there's there's some indication to somebody that, that yes, that's a tarpon. So, mm -hmm. the moon. Actually, we did have somebody look at the other one and say, "Now, what am I looking at here?" Yeah. So they didn't recognize it as the moon. You know. And we, and in a way, what we want, as Bob said earlier, was that we wanted the light. And we wanted that sense of, you know, one of the things that this was, um, this was, uh, a, this is a painting sort of of the sculpture in New York called Breath of Water. And this was a sculpture about the idea of water, but we made it white. And partly we made it white because it was an installation in New York in the winter. So it was like snow, right? The thing about water that's so interesting is that water changes. It's a shape changer, right? It's snow, it's ice, it's vapor, it's, you know, it's not liquid, it's, it moves all the time. So the issue of identity is really important because how do you account for it being the same thing, but yet it changes all the time? It's Heraclitus' famous saying, you can't step into the same river twice because you know it's about how do you have identity when there's change and so we like the idea of doing breath of water that was white <coughs> and then capturing that and it's the white on white then that made the moon seem sort of obvious and then the water um, connection sure. we also have to say that Sunday was the Chinese New Year mm -hmm. start and it's the lunar um, the and it's the year of the snake. So we thought someone yeah. came and told us that, and we thought that was pretty serendipitous. Mm -hmm. right. I say leaving out the blue, I think, is fantastic. It makes well, it much finer. Thank you. Yeah, it's and, and it's, it, it's something that, that we do a lot with things. I mean, you know, we're, we're interested in the Gulf of Mexico, but we're interested in, in dealing with these things from we're trying to find a different way of looking at it, you know, for ourselves and maybe not for other people. But Carol mentioned something, and this was a, a major seed to a lot of this. She was discussing it with an architect when we were doing 160 tons stone sculpture in Indianapolis. And it was alongside a river. And they started discussing Heraclides, Heracles. and, Heracles and, and how you can't step into the same river twice. And my mind just immediately visualized the problems of making that. And I said, wow, what a great concept. An artist could spend their lifetime with that. And, and Carol and the architect turned around and looked at me, you know, because they, they, you know, it was like I was reacting to the intellectual statement that you can't step into the same river twice, which is basic 101 philosophy or something like that, you know. And, and, but what I was challenged with, what I saw immediately was, the impossibility of making you can't step into the same river twice. Therefore, it would be something you could spend your life pursuing as an artist. And it turns out that really that's what all our work's really about, is um, how, that, how do you do that? 
and it, it's not a it, it's not an easy you know it's a concept you'll never be able to make one of because it, it you just can't but what it is the pursuit of that certainly allows you to see things see possibilities and potential uh, that that uh, falls into into place and you know we're making art here as we said we're not making moons we're not making water or anything like that we're making art and and the art is translated into two-dimensional or three-dimensional things. And it, we find it driving us because we're fascinated to see what it's going to look like. You know, and, and for me, you know, as, as, as it was said, I've you know, been making art for a long, long, long time, so I have a long history behind me. And, and coming together with Carol, it's, a, it's like I'm starting all over again. And it, it's this great gift to be able to, to uh, have, um, you know, a, a sense of starting uh, as a young artist again, with but with my experience, she, <laughs> you know, it's she, like a great do-over. Sheila says it's a reflection of a love affair. And yeah, I, yeah, she said that. Yeah, and, and she wasn't the only one who said that. Megan Bowler yeah, in, this in, article. in, in yeah, yeah. Creative yeah. Loafing yeah. Uh, yeah. mentioned mentioned the love. This art uh, reflects or represents what is truly great about art. And that is three elements. It has an intellectual content, uh, it's got beauty, and it has great craftsmanship. And that's what I look for. Uh, not certainly all the artists with whom we work have all three elements, but this, this art certainly does. Uh, one does not have to fully deconstruct it to understand who Heraclitus or whatever. Heraclitus. Is. I mean, you don't have to. You can. I like that. If you want. Miraculous. <laughs> but you don't have to. It's no, you don't take, at all. You can accept the art for what it represents, which is very visually, very compelling and beautifully crafted. Well, thank you, Alan. <laughs> well, why do you think you're in here? <laughs> I was just going to say, you want to give us a show? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. That, that, that painting back there is, uh, you know, Way, way underpriced at sixteen thousand dollars. <laughs> I just that's a really, really great painting. Anyway, yes. Uh, the, you have uh, a question. They'll be happy to answer questions uh, by us uh, solely or together. Whatever. Go ahead. Um, so this is sort of the opposite of what you guys have been talking about: love and collaboration. Do you have conflicts um, and? How do you work those out? Well, <laughs> we get divorced we, we, every week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we have a show coming down this weekend and a show opening up this weekend, and the tensions have been yeah. have been high. And uh, yeah, yeah, as Carol said, we've been you know gonna get divorced the last three nights in a row. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Not you can't help. Night. You know, you get tired. You're you're you know you want it to be a certain way, and you know we. Sure. The yeah. the American print we did in Italy in Cortona, Italy, in a uh, in, in a laundry room, a laundry room laundry of a convent, room. and it was it was just absolutely idiotic. But we had some doozy Italian oh, yeah. fights. And, I, mean, and point, I was so mad at him, and I had a Kleenex in my hand, and I threw it with all my might, and, and we just <laughs> burst out laughing. But that, we that, were that, so angry. That we were particular just, work of art. Yeah. Uh, when was that done? 2001. 2001. Okay, so that's fairly early in your collection. Yes, yeah. it is. And when was this done? Uh, 2008. Yeah, well, in any event, and, but the one around the corner, the uh, American print, or uh, Bob would say, ode to a two by four, yeah. really reflects his, it's got both elements in it. It's got some of early Bob, but it certainly has got a lot of Carol in it. That's her mm -hmm. poem, kind of hard to read, but that's, that's Carol's poem. Uh, and then the one right around the corner here is also, that's a much more recent painting though, isn't it? It's the it? same as that, 2008. It was done at the same time, the, yeah. the well, little ones. The this this ones. has some stack house, the uh, structural elements in the middle uh, that, that some people may recognize. Anyhow, I'm talking much too much. <laughs> Yes. Um, well, that piece over there and this one are my favorite pieces that oh. I've seen in here. And they both have a frame, and the picture sort of bleeds off the frame. In that one, it's almost like a waterfall. Right. And this one, um, the very end of that. I was wondering if you guys could speak to that a little bit. If well, that was intentional. Um, it's definitely intentional. And that happens in a lot of our work that um, we have a border, but we break the border. Mm -hmm. 
And this piece was in a gallery that you couldn't go in, and it was all glass. And the um, structure went all the way to the windows. And it looked like it wanted to burst through the window and fill all of New York City. So it was important that it didn't fit inside, that it wasn't contained. So you got this feeling like it was coming out. But it's very much like a light, right? Light's not contained. It keeps coming out. So that's very perceptive of our work, because breaking the border means something to us. Um, it's, it's a painting device, in a way. You're, in, you're, you're more part of that image by the fact that it breaks the plane of the, the surface and goes beyond what you, what you can actually see. It gives you a little bit more of a sense of being in that structure. Uh, this one over here, what it does is there's a, a border. There's the uh, that, that's actually the before the Tampa Museum of Art uh, was, was built. That was a proposal for for something there. But the the structure is bigger than the the frame that it's in, and then there's the water flowing all over. It's just about dynamic. And the piece is called Architectured Water. Mm -hmm. So it was part of the Water series. And one of the things we do is we make two-dimensional and three-dimensional work. And with the water series, we were trying to represent water both two-dimensionally and three-dimensionally. And if you go to the Ringling College tomorrow, our sculptures and installations, you walk through them. They, they aren't just, they're big things that you walk into. So that was a sculpture that would be 30 feet tall that you would walk through. It would be covered with glass and it was to connect the architecture of water. And there's two little paintings on the other side, and one of them is the architecture of water. It's that structure, but the molecular structure of water is drawn on it, which is the architecture of water. And it's really fascinating. If you Google about water and its molecular structure, you find out that it is, it is in debate what the molecular structure of water is and how it works. And Livermore Labs, there's scientists that are working on this. And it turns out that water, the molecule, molecular structure, is completely anom anomalous. And the claim is that if water wasn't anomalous, we wouldn't have life on this planet. And you know, you go through school and you think, water, H2O, H2O. I mean, <laughs> that's something we all know. but. No. Lawrence Livermore is arguing. It. So, and, and people at Berkeley, and then mm -hmm. um, on the East Coast. So, um, so looking at the architecture of water. So, how do you actually capture something like water, which is, you know, one of the basic things in our lives? But we're also making art, yeah. right? And it's real cool. That's a painting yeah. device right. that I learned a long time ago. You, you create a border and then you break it. Yes, sir. Yeah, you've kind of pre-answered my question, but one thing, the, the strong thing I noticed about your art is the, uh, the architectural element to it and the fascination with structure. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say you're fascinated with the architecture of organic things or the idea of it? Is it standing for something or you're trying to capture the thing itself? Um, I, I could say yes. Okay, <laughs> cool, man. I mean, um, you know, we, we certainly are interested in in the architecture of things, especially when you make structures. Mm -hmm. You have to be. I mean, uh, it has to have its own structural integrity. Right? So mm -hmm. you, you, you need to incorporate that into the design as much as you can. Mm -hmm. right? But then there's also the aesthetic qualities of that structure and the repetitive form, all the kind of things that, that artists like to think of that make images pleasing, sort of fits some of those three things that Alan said he likes about art. But one of the things about the organic is this painting, for example, is a is a is in a sense a painting of a piece of architecture. Mm -hmm. But it's called chrysanthemum. Right. Because, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, one of the hard things is naming your work. But, you know, we looked at it and we said chrysanthemum. Mm -hmm. It just... So that connection between the architecture mm -hmm. and the organic form seemed perfectly right. Okay. And to think of water as having architecture, which you think it doesn't, right. we love that. I assume you've probably looked at a lot of time-lapse 
movies of water and the patterns it makes and the surface tension. We, we live on the water. We live on Tampa yeah. Bay and we live on an area where we walk out and the water's only this deep for hundreds of And we of photograph it and mm -hmm. manipulate it. So it's a constant study. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. If, if you didn't live in Florida or in Tampa, would the work reflect that? Yeah. Yes. I'm sure it would. I think it would. It wouldn't be as specific, maybe, right. about the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Could be Chesapeake Bay, or could be, yeah. you know, Pacific Ocean, or whoever. Uh, we did when we lived in Kansas City. The one thing that that probably wasn't as satisfying about living in Kansas City was too far from the ocean. Yeah. We're ocean <laughs> people. I was born in New Jersey. I was born in New York City. So. We gotta have salt water somewhere. And one of the reasons why I lived in this area called the Plaza is it was where the biggest fountain was, mm -hmm. so I could be near the water. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have a question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Good. Now I have a glass of wine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.